thick description toward an interpretive theory of culture. 1. In her book, Philosophy in a New Key, Suzanne Langer remarks that certain ideas burst upon the intellectual landscape with a tremendous force. They resolve so many fundamental problems at once that they seem also to promise that they will resolve all fundamental problems, clarify all obscure issues. Everyone snaps them up as the open sesame of some new positive science, the conceptual center point around which a comprehensive system of analysis can be built. The sudden vogue of such a grande idée, crowding out almost everything else for a while, is due, she says, to the fact that all sensitive and active minds turn at once to exploiting it. We try it in every connection, for every purpose, experiment with possible stretches of its strict meaning, with generalizations and derivatives. After we have become familiar with the new idea, however, after it has become part of our general stock of theoretical concepts, our expectations are brought more into balance with its actual uses and its excessive popularity is ended. A few zealots persist in the old key-to-the-universe view of it, but less driven thinkers settle down after a while to the problems the idea has really generated. They try to apply it and extend it where it applies and where it is capable of extension, and they desist where it does not apply or cannot be extended. It becomes, if it was in truth a seminal idea in the first place, a permanent and enduring part of our intellectual armory but it no longer has the grandiose, all-promising scope, the infinite versatility of apparent application it once had. The second law of thermodynamics, or the principle of natural selection, or the notion of unconscious motivation, or the organization of the means of production, does not explain everything, not even everything human, but it still explains something, and our attention shifts to isolating just what that something is, to disentangling ourselves from a lot of pseudoscience to which, in the first flush of its celebrity, it has also given rise. Whether or not this is, in fact, the way all centrally important scientific concepts develop, I don't know, but certainly this pattern fits the concept of culture, around which the whole discipline of anthropology arose, and whose domination that discipline has been increasingly concerned to limit, specify, focus, and contain. It is to this cutting of the culture concept down to size, therefore actually ensuring its continued importance rather than undermining it, that the essays below are all, in their several ways and from their several directions, dedicated. They all argue, sometimes explicitly, more often merely through the particular analysis they develop, for a narrowed, specialized, and, so I imagine, theoretically more powerful concept of culture to replace E.B. Tyler's famous most complex whole, which, its originative power not denied, seems to me to have reached the point where it obscures a good deal more than it reveals. The conceptual morass into which the Tylorian kind of peau à feu theorizing about culture can lead is evident in what is still one of the better general introductions to anthropology, Clyde Cluckhone's Mirror for Man, in some 27 pages of his chapter on the concept, Cluckhone managed to define culture in turn as 1. The total way of life of a people. 2. The social legacy the individual acquires from his group. 3. A way of thinking, feeling, and believing. 4. An abstraction from behavior. 5. A theory on the part of the anthropologist about the way in which a group of people in fact behave. 6. A storehouse of pooled learning. 7. A set of standardized orientations to recurrent problems. 8. Learned behavior. 9. A mechanism for the normative regulation of behavior. 10. A set of techniques for adjusting both to the external environment and to other men. 11. A precipitate of history. And turning, perhaps in desperation, to similes as a map, as a sieve, and as a matrix. In the face of this sort of theoretical diffusion, even a somewhat constricted and not entirely standard concept of culture, which is at least internally coherent and, more important, which has a definable argument to make, is, as, to be fair, Cluckhone himself 
keenly realised, an improvement. Eclecticism is self-defeating not because there is only one direction in which it is useful to move, but because there are so many. It is necessary to choose. The concept of culture I espouse, and whose utility the essays below attempt to demonstrate, is essentially a semiotic one. Believing, with Max Weber, that man is an animal suspended in webs of significance he himself has spun, I take culture to be those webs, and the analysis of it to be therefore not an experimental science in search of law, but an interpretive one in search of meaning. It is explication I am after, construing social expressions on their surface enigmatical. But this pronouncement, a doctrine in a clause, demands itself some explication. 2. Operationalism as a methodological dogma never made much sense so far as the social sciences are concerned, and except for a few rather too well-swept corners, Skinnerian behaviorism, intelligence testing, and so on, it is largely dead now. But it had, for all that, an important point to make, which, however we may feel about trying to define charisma or alienation in terms of operations, retains a certain force. If you want to understand what a science is, you should look in the first instance not at its theories or its findings, and certainly not at what its apologists say about it. You should look at what the practitioners of it do. In anthropology, or anyway, social anthropology, what the practitioners do is ethnography, and it is in understanding what ethnography is, or more exactly, what doing ethnography is, that a start can be made toward grasping what anthropological analysis amounts to as a form of knowledge. This, it must immediately be said, is not a matter of methods. From one point of view, that of the textbook, doing ethnography is establishing rapport, selecting informants, transcribing texts, taking genealogies, mapping fields, keeping a diary, and so on. But it is not these things, techniques, and received procedures that define the enterprise. What defines it is the kind of intellectual effort it is, an elaborate venture in, to borrow a notion from Gilbert Ryle, thick description. Ryle's discussion of thick description appears in two recent essays of his, now reprinted in the second volume of his collected papers, addressed to the general question of what, as he puts it, le penseur is doing, thinking and reflecting, and the thinking of thoughts. Consider, he says, two boys rapidly contracting the eyelids of their eyes. In one, this is an involuntary twitch, in the other, a conspiratorial signal to a friend, the two movements are, as movements, identical. From an I am a camera, phenomenalistic observation of them alone, one could not tell which was twitch and which was wink, or indeed whether both or either was twitch or wink. Yet the difference, however unphotographable, between a twitch and a wink is vast, as anyone unfortunate enough to have had the first taken for the second knows. The winker is communicating, and indeed communicating in a quite precise and special way. One, deliberately. Two, to someone in particular. Three, to impart a particular message. Four, according to a socially established code. And five, without cognizance of the rest of the company. As Ryle points out, the winker has not done two things, contracted his eyelids and winked, while the twitcher has done only one, contracted his eyelids. Contracting your eyelids on purpose when there exists a public code in which so doing counts as a conspiratorial signal is winking. That's all there is to it. A speck of behavior, a fleck of culture, and voila, a gesture. That, however, is just the beginning. Suppose, he continues, there is a third boy who, to give malicious amusement to his cronies, parodies the first boy's wink as amateurish, clumsy, obvious, and so on. He, of course, does this in the same way the second boy winked and the first twitched, by contracting his right eyelids. Only this boy is neither winking nor twitching. He is parodying someone else's, as he takes it, laughable attempt at winking. Here, too, a socially established code exists. He will wink laboriously, over-obviously, perhaps adding a grimace, the usual artifices of the clown. And so also does a message. Only now it is not conspiracy, but ridicule that is in the air. 
If the others think he is actually winking, his whole project misfires as completely, though with somewhat different results, as if they think he is twitching. One can go further. Uncertain of his mimicking abilities, the would-be satirist may practice at home before the mirror, in which case he is not twitching, winking, or parodying, but rehearsing, though so far as what a camera, a radical behaviorist, or a believer in protocol sentences would record, he is just rapidly contracting his right eyelids, like all the others. Complexities are possible, if not practically without end, at least logically so. The original winker might, for example, actually have been fake winking, say, to mislead outsiders into imagining there was a conspiracy afoot when there in fact was not, in which case our descriptions of what the parodist is parodying and the rehearser rehearsing, of course, shift accordingly. But the point is that between what Ryle calls the thin description of what the rehearser, parodist, winker, twitcher, is doing, rapidly contracting his right eyelids, and the thick description of what he is doing, practicing a burlesque of a friend faking a wink to deceive an innocent into thinking a conspiracy is in motion, lies the object of ethnography. A stratified hierarchy of meaningful structures in terms of which twitches, winks, fake winks, parodies, rehearsals of parodies are produced, perceived, and interpreted, and without which they would not, not even the zero-form twitches, which, as a cultural category, are as much non-winks as winks and non-twitches, in fact exist, no matter what anyone did or didn't do with his eyelids. Like so many of the little stories Oxford philosophers like to make up for themselves, all this winking, fake winking, burlesque fake winking, rehearsed burlesque fake winking may seem a bit artificial. In way of adding a more empirical note, let me give, deliberately unpreceded by any prior explanatory comment at all, a not untypical excerpt from my own field journal to demonstrate that, however evened off for didactic purposes, Ryle's example presents an image only too exact of the sort of piled-up structures of inference and implication through which an ethnographer is continually trying to pick his way. The French, the informant said, had only just arrived. They set up twenty or so small forts between here, the town, and the Marmusha area up in the middle of the mountains, placing them on promontories so they could survey the countryside. But for all this, they couldn't guarantee safety, especially at night. So although the Mesrag, trade pact system, was supposed to be legally abolished, it in fact continued as before. One night, when Cohen, who speaks fluent Berber, was up there, at Marmusha, two other Jews who were traders to a neighbouring tribe came by to purchase some goods from him. Some Berbers, from yet another neighbouring tribe, tried to break into Cohen's place, but he fired his rifle in the air. Traditionally, Jews were not allowed to carry weapons, but at this period things were so unsettled, many did so anyway. This attracted the attention of the French, and the marauders fled. The next night, however, they came back, one of them disguised as a woman who knocked on the door with some sort of story. Cohen was suspicious and didn't want to let her in, but the other Jews said, Oh, it's all right. It's only a woman. So they opened the door, and the whole lot came pouring in. They killed the two visiting Jews, but Cohen managed to barricade himself in an adjoining room. He heard the robbers planning to burn him alive in the shop after they removed his goods, and so he opened the door and, laying about him wildly with a club, managed to escape through a window. He went up to the fort, then, to have his wounds dressed, and complained to the local commandant, one Captain Dumari, saying he wanted his... Ah i.e. four or five times the value of the merchandise stolen from him. The robbers were from a tribe which had not yet submitted to French authority and were in open rebellion against it, and he wanted authorization to go with his Mesrag holder, the Marmusha tribal sheikh, to collect the indemnity that, under traditional rules, he had coming to him. Captain Dumari couldn't officially give him permission to do this because of the French prohibition of the Mesrag relationship, but he gave him verbal authorization, saying... If you get killed, it's your problem. So the sheikh, the Jew, and a small company of armed Marmushans went off ten or fifteen kilometres up into the rebellious area, where there were, of course, no French, and, sneaking up, captured the thief tribe's shepherd and stole its herds. The other tribes soon came riding out on horses after them, armed with rifles and ready to attack. But when they saw who the sheep thieves were, they thought better of it and said, All right, we'll talk. 
they couldn't really deny what had happened, that some of their men had robbed Cohen and killed the two visitors. And they weren't prepared to start the serious feud with the Marmusha, a scuffle with the invading party would bring on. So the two groups talked and talked and talked, there on the plain amid the thousands of sheep, and decided finally on 500 sheep damages. The two armed Berber groups then lined up on their horses at opposite ends of the plain, with the sheep herded between them, and Cohen, in his black gown, pillbox hat, and flapping slippers, went out alone among the sheep, picking out, one by one, and at his own good speed, the best ones for his payment. So Cohen got his sheep and drove them back to Marmusha. The French, up in their fort, heard them coming from some distance. Ba, 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 said Cohen happily, recalling the image, and said, what the hell is that? And Cohen said, that is my air. The French couldn't believe he had actually done what he said he had done, and accused him of being a spy for the rebellious Berbers, put him in prison, and took his sheep. In the town, his family, not having heard from him in so long a time, thought he was dead. But after a while, the French released him, and he came back home, but without his sheep. He then went to the colonel in the town, the Frenchman in charge of the whole region, to complain. But the colonel said, I can't do anything about the matter. It's not my problem. Quoted raw, a note in a bottle. This passage conveys, as any similar one similarly presented would do, a fair sense of how much goes into ethnographic description of even the most elemental sort, how extraordinarily thick it is. In finished anthropological writings, including those collected here, this fact, that what we call our data are really our own constructions of other people's constructions of what they and their compatriots are up to, is obscured because most of what we need to comprehend a particular event, ritual, custom, idea, or whatever, is insinuated as background information before the thing itself is directly examined. Even to reveal that this little drama took place in the highlands of central Morocco in 1912 and was recounted there in 1968 is to determine much of our understanding of it. There is nothing particularly wrong with this, and it is in any case inevitable but it does lead to a view of anthropological research as rather more of an observational and rather less of an interpretive activity than it really is. Right down at the factual base, the hard rock, insofar as there is any, of the whole enterprise, we are already explicating, and worse, explicating explications, winks upon winks upon winks. Analysis, then, is sorting out the structures of signification, what Ryle called established codes, a somewhat misleading expression, for it makes the enterprise sound too much like that of the cipher clerk, when it is much more like that of the literary critic, and determining their social ground and import. Here in our text, such sorting would begin with distinguishing the three unlike frames of interpretation ingredient in the situation, Jewish, Berber, and French, and would then move on to show how and why, at that time, in that place, their co-presence produced a situation in which systematic misunderstanding reduced traditional form to social farce. What tripped Cohen up, and with him the whole ancient pattern of social and economic relationships within which he functioned, was a confusion of tongues. I shall come back to this too compacted aphorism later, as well as to the details of the text itself. The point for now is only that ethnography is thick description, what the ethnographer is in fact faced with, except when, as of course he must do, he is pursuing the more automatized routines of data collection, is a multiplicity of complex conceptual structures, many of them superimposed upon or knotted into one another, which are at once strange, irregular, and inexplicit, and which he must contrive somehow first to grasp and then to render. And this is true at the most down-to-earth jungle fieldwork levels of his activity. Interviewing informants, observing rituals, eliciting kin terms, tracing property lines, censusing households, writing his journal. Doing ethnography is like trying to read in the sense of construct a reading of, a manuscript. Foreign, faded, full of ellipses, incoherencies, suspicious emendations and tendentious commentaries but written not in conventionalized graphs of sound, but in transient examples of shaped behavior. 3. Culture. This acted document thus is public, like a burlesque wink or a mock sheep raid. 
Though ideational, it does not exist in someone's head. Though unphysical, it is not an occult entity. The interminable, because unterminable, debate within anthropology as to whether culture is subjective or objective, together with the mutual exchange of intellectual insults, idealist, materialist, mentalist, behaviorist, impressionist, positivist, which accompanies it, is wholly misconceived. Once human behavior is seen as, most of the time, there are true twitches, symbolic action, action which, like phonation in speech, pigment in painting, line in writing, or sonnets in music signifies, the question as to whether culture is patterned, conduct, or a frame of mind, or even the two somehow mixed together, loses sense. The thing to ask about a burlesque twink or a mock sheep raid is not what their ontological status is. It is the same as that of rocks on the one hand and dreams on the other. They are things of this world. The thing to ask is what their import is. What it is, ridicule or challenge, irony or anger, snobbery or pride, that in their occurrence and through their agency is getting said. This may seem like an obvious truth, but there are a number of ways to obscure it. One is to imagine that culture is a self-contained, super-organic reality, with forces and purposes of its own. That is, to reify it. Another is to claim that it consists in the brute pattern of behavioural events we observe, in fact, to occur in some identifiable community or other. That is, to reduce it. But though both these confusions still exist, and doubtless will always be with us, the main source of theoretical muddlement in contemporary anthropology is a view which developed in reaction to them and is right now very widely held, namely that, to quote Ward Goodenough, perhaps its leading proponent, culture is located in the minds and hearts of men. Variously called ethnoscience, componential analysis or cognitive anthropology, a terminological wavering which reflects a deeper uncertainty, this school of thought holds that culture is composed of psychological structures by means of which individuals or groups of individuals guide their behavior. A society's culture, to quote good enough again, this time in a passage which has become the locus classicus of the whole movement, consists of whatever it is one has to know or believe in order to operate in a manner acceptable to its members. And from this view of what culture is follows a view, equally assured, of what describing it is. The writing out of systematic rules, an ethnographic algorithm, which, if followed, would make it possible so to operate, to pass, physical appearance aside, for a native. In such a way, extreme subjectivism is married to extreme formalism, with the expected result. An explosion of debate as to whether particular analyses which come in the form of taxonomies, paradigms, tables, trees, and other ingenuities, reflect what the natives really think, or are merely clever simulations, logically equivalent but substantively different, of what they think. As, on first glance, this approach may look close enough to the one being developed here to be mistaken for it, it is useful to be explicit as to what divides them. If, leaving our winks and sheep behind for the moment, we take, say, a Beethoven quartet as an admittedly rather special, but for these purposes nicely illustrative, sample of culture, no one would, I think, identify it with its score, with the skills and knowledge needed to play it, with the understanding of it possessed by its performers or auditors, nor to take care, en passant, of the reductionists and reifiers, with a particular performance of it, or with some mysterious entity transcending material existence. The no one is perhaps too strong here, for there are always incorrigibles. But that a Beethoven quartet is a temporarily divided tonal structure, a coherent sequence of modelled sound in a word music, and not anybody's knowledge of or belief about anything, including how to play it, is a proposition to which most people are, upon reflection, likely to assent. To play the violin, it is necessary to possess certain habits, skills, knowledge, and talents, to be in the mood to play, and, as the old joke goes, to have a violin. But violin playing is neither the habit, skills, knowledge, and so on, nor the mood, nor, the notion believers in material culture apparently embrace, the violin. To make a trade pact in Morocco, you have to do certain things in certain ways. Among others, cut, while chanting Quranic Arabic, the throat of a lamb before the assembled, undeformed adult male members of your tribe, and to be possessed of certain psychological characteristics, among others a desire for distant things. 
But a trade pact is neither the throat-cutting nor the desire, though it is real enough, as seven kinsmen of our Marmusha Sheikh discovered when, on an earlier occasion, they were executed by him following the theft of one mangy, essentially valueless sheepskin from Cohn. Culture is public, because meaning is. You can't wink, or burlesque one, without knowing what counts as winking, or how, physically, to contract your eyelids. And you can't conduct a sheep raid, or mimic one, without knowing what it is to steal a sheep, and how practically to go about it. But to draw from such truths the conclusion that knowing how to wink is winking, and knowing how to steal a sheep is sheep raiding, is to betray as deep a confusion as, taking thin descriptions for thick, to identify winking with eyelid contractions, or sheep raiding with chasing woolly animals out of pastures. The cognitivist fallacy that culture consists, to quote another spokesman for this movement, Stephen Tyler, of mental phenomena which can, he means should, be analysed by formal methods similar to those of mathematics and logic, is as destructive of an effective use of the concept as are the behaviourist and idealist fallacies to which it is a misdrawn correction. Perhaps, as its errors are more sophisticated and its distortion subtler, it is even more so. The generalised attack on privacy theories of meaning is, since early Husserl and late Wittgenstein, so much a part of modern thought that it need not be developed once more here. What is necessary is to see to it that the news of it reaches anthropology, and in particular that it is made clear that to say that culture consists of socially established structures of meaning, in terms of which people do such things as signal conspiracies and join them, or perceive insults and answer them, is no more to say that it is a psychological phenomenon, a characteristic of someone's mind, personality, cognitive structure, or whatever, than to say that tantrism, genetics, the progressive form of the verb, the classification of wines, the common law, or the notion of a conditional curse, as Westermark defined the concept of ah, in terms of which Cohen pressed his claim to damages, is. What, in a place like Morocco, most prevents those of us who grew up winking other winks or attending other sheep from grasping what people are up to is not ignorance as to how cognition works, though especially as one assumes it works the same among them as it does among us, it would greatly help to have less of that too, as a lack of familiarity with the imaginative universe within which their acts are signs. As Wittgenstein has been invoked, he may as well be quoted. We say of some people that they are transparent to us. It is, however, important as regards this observation that one human being can be a complete enigma to another. We learn this when we come into a strange country with entirely strange traditions, and, what is more, even given a mastery of the country's language. We do not understand the people, and not because of not knowing what they are saying to themselves. We cannot find our feet with them. 4. Finding our feet, an unnerving business which never more than distantly succeeds, is what ethnographic research consists of as a personal experience. Trying to formulate the basis on which one imagines, always excessively, one has found them, is what anthropological writing consists of as a scientific endeavour. We are not, or at least I am not, seeking either to become natives, a compromised word in any case, or to mimic them. Only romantics or spies would seem to find point in that. We are seeking, in the widened sense of the term, in which it encompasses very much more than talk, to converse with them, a matter a great deal more difficult, and not only with strangers, than is commonly recognised. If speaking for someone else seems to be a mysterious process, Stanley Cavill has remarked, that may be because speaking to someone does not seem mysterious enough. Looked at this way, the aim of anthropology is the enlargement of the universe of human discourse. That is not, of course, its only aim. Instruction, amusement, practical counsel, moral advance, and the discovery of natural order and human behaviour are others, nor is anthropology the only discipline which pursues it. But it is an aim to which a semiotic concept of culture is peculiarly well adapted. As interworked systems of construable signs, what, ignoring provincial usages, I would call symbols, culture is not a power, 
something to which social events, behaviours, institutions or processes can be causally attributed, it is a context, something within which they can be intelligibly, that is, thickly, described. The famous anthropological absorption with the, to us, exotic Berber horsemen, Jewish peddlers, French legionnaires, is thus essentially a device for displacing the dulling sense of familiarity with which the mysteriousness of our own ability to relate perceptively to one another is concealed from us. Looking at the ordinary in places where it takes unaccustomed forms brings out not, as has so often been claimed, the arbitrariness of human behaviour. There is nothing especially arbitrary about taking sheep theft for insolence in Morocco, but the degree to which its meaning varies according to the pattern of life by which it is informed. Understanding a people's culture exposes their normalness without reducing their particularity. The more I manage to follow what the Moroccans are up to, the more logical and the more singular they seem. It renders them accessible, setting them in the frame of their own banalities. It dissolves their opacity. It is this manoeuvre, usually to casually refer to as seeing things from the actor's point of view, too bookishly as the Verstehen approach, or too technically as emic analysis, that so often leads to the notion that anthropology is a variety of either long-distance mind-reading or cannibal isle fantasizing, and which, for someone anxious to navigate past the wrecks of a dozen sunken philosophies, must therefore be executed with a great deal of care. Nothing is more necessary to comprehending what anthropological interpretation is and the degree to which it is interpretation than an exact understanding of what it means and what it does not mean to say that our formulations of other people's symbol systems must be actor-oriented. Note, not only other people's. Anthropology can be trained on the culture of which it is itself a part, and it increasingly is a fact of profound importance, but which, as it raises a few tricky and rather special second-order problems, I shall put to the side for the moment. End note. What it means is that descriptions of Berber, Jewish, or French culture must be cast in terms of the constructions we imagine Berbers, Jews, or Frenchmen to place upon what they live through, the formulae they use to define what happens to them. What it does not mean is that such descriptions are themselves Berber, Jewish, or French, that is, part of the reality they are ostensibly describing, they are anthropological. That is, part of a developing system of scientific analysis. They must be cast in terms of the interpretations to which persons of a particular denomination subject their experience, because that is what they profess to be descriptions of. They are anthropological because it is, in fact, anthropologists who profess them. Normally, it is not necessary to point out quite so laboriously that the object of study is one thing and the study of it another. It is clear enough that the physical world is not physics and that a skeleton key to Finnegan's wake not Finnegan's wake, but, as in the study of culture, analysis penetrates into the very body of the object, that is, we begin with our own interpretations of what our informants are up to, or think they are up to, and then systematize those, the line between Moroccan culture as a natural fact and Moroccan culture as a theoretical entity tends to get blurred, all the more so as the latter is presented in the form of an actor's eye description of Moroccan conceptions of everything from violence, honour, divinity and justice to tribe, property, patronage and chiefship. In short, anthropological writings are themselves interpretations, and second and third order ones to boot. By definition, only a native makes first-order ones. It's his culture. Note. The order problem is again complex. Anthropological works based on other anthropological works, Levi Strauss's, for example, may of course be fourth order or higher, and informants frequently, even habitually, make second-order interpretations, what have come to be known as native models. In literate cultures, where a native interpretation can proceed to higher levels. In connection with the Maghreb, one has only to think of Ibn Khaldun with the United States, Margaret Mead. These matters become intricate indeed. End note. They are thus fictions. Fictions in the sense that they are something made, something fashioned, the original meaning of fictio. 
not that they are false, unfactual, or merely as-if thought experiments. To construct actor-oriented descriptions of the involvements of a Berber chieftain, a Jewish merchant, and a French soldier with one another in 1912 Morocco is clearly an imaginative act, not all that different from constructing similar descriptions of, say, the involvements with one another of a provincial French doctor, his silly adulterous wife, and her feckless lover in 19th century France. In the latter case, the actors are represented as not having existed, and the events as not having happened, while in the former they are represented as actual, or as having been so. This is a difference of no mean importance, indeed precisely the one Madame Bovary had difficulty grasping. But the importance does not lie in the fact that her story was created while Cohen's was only noted. The conditions of their creation, and the point of it, to say nothing of the manner and the quality, differ. But the one is as much a fictio, a making, as the other. Anthropologists have not always been as aware as they might be of this fact. That, although culture exists in the trading post, the hill fort, or the sheep run, anthropology exists in the book, the article, the lecture, the museum display, or sometimes nowadays the film. To become aware of it is to realize that the line between mode of representation and substantive content is as undrawable in cultural analysis as it is in painting. And that fact in turn seems to threaten the objective status of anthropological knowledge by suggesting that its source is not social reality, but scholarly artifice. It does threaten it, but the threat is hollow. The claim to attention of an ethnographic account does not rest on its author's ability to capture primitive facts in faraway places and carry them home like a mask or a carving, but on the degree to which she is able to clarify what goes on in such places, to reduce the puzzlement. What manner of man are these? To which unfamiliar acts emerging out of unknown backgrounds naturally give rise. This raises some serious problems of verification. All right. Or if verification is too strong a word for so soft a science, I myself would prefer appraisal of how you can tell a better account from a worse one. But that is precisely the virtue of it. If ethnography is thick description, and ethnographers those who are doing the describing, then the determining question for any given example of it, whether a field journal squib or a Malinowski-sized monograph, is whether it sorts winks from twitches and real winks from mimicked ones. It is not against a body of uninterpreted data, radically thinned descriptions, that we must measure the cogency of our explications, but against the power of the scientific imagination to bring us into touch with the lives of strangers. It is not worth it, as Thoreau said, to go round the world to count the cats in Zanzibar. <laughs>